It is a pleasure to be, have been able to present the 2016 ESC guidelines on atrial fibrillation here in Rome. It's a wonderful sunny place, over 30,000 people here and very friendly Itali Italian people here. Atrial fibrillation is a chronic disease that is dangerous and the management should comprise five domains. Three of those domains have a prognostic impact, which means they can prolong life and they can prevent serious complications. They are the following. You need to stabilize the patient hemodynamically acutely. You also need to detect and treat underlying cardiovascular diseases, such as heart failure, but also hypertension, diabetes, obesity, valvular heart disease, and coronary heart disease. And of course, you need to assess stroke risk of the patient and then decide on anticoagulation. Patients who have two of the Chartsvask risk factors, and that applies to women with a Chartsvask score of three and men with a Chartsvask score of two, have a clear indication for oral anticoagulation to prevent strokes. In patients in whom non-vitamin K antagonists can be used, the ESC guidelines recommend uh, to prefer NOAX over vitamin K antagonists because they are safer in terms of intracranial hemorrhage and there is a 10% lower mortality both in the phase 3 control trials and in observational data sets. Patients with one of the Chartsvask factors, i.e. women with a Chartsvask score of 2 and men with a Chartsvask score of 1 should be considered for oral anticoagulation. Some of these patients have a relatively low stroke risk whilst others may have a high stroke risk. And we have some evidence that stroke rates can be reduced by anticoagulation, but the evidence is not as clear. Patients without stroke risk factors do not need antithrombotic therapy. Rhythm control therapy is an important component of AF management and should be offered to all patients who remain symptomatic on optimal rate control therapy. We know from observational data sets that rhythm control therapy is not offered to everyone. And that is partially because of concerns of the safety. We have good data on in which patients to use which antiarrhythmic drugs. And we have a clear guidance on how to choose a safe antiarrhythmic drug in the guidelines. Antiarrhythmic drugs are not always effective, nor is catheter ablation but catheter ablation is slightly more effective than antiarrhythmic drugs in preventing recurrent atrial fibrillation and in improving uh, symptoms. Therefore, there is a choice between antiarrhythmic drugs and catheter ablation in suitable patients when the ablation is performed in an experienced center. The recommendation for um, catheter ablation as first-line therapy is a class 2A based on smaller studies in experienced centers. In patients who failed antiarrhythmic drug therapy, catheter ablation is one of the main treatment options if further rhythm control therapy is needed, i.e. if the patients are still symptomatic. Catheter ablation should target the pulmonary veins. The evidence for pulmonary vein isolation, either with cryoballoons or with radiofrequency energy, is very good. The evidence for other added ablation procedures is less good. We have commissioned a systematic review done by the Cochrane Group UK to uh, assess whether catheter ablation is more or less effective than cardioversion and antiarrhythmic drug therapy in patients with persistent atrial fibrillation. And indeed, catheter ablation, according to the available data, which is not fully robust, is more effective than antiarrhythmic drugs. There is also an option to change to another antiarrhythmic drug and an option to consider hybrid therapy. And we, in the guidelines task force, believe that hybrid therapy is an important option. Patients who have failed the second rhythm control therapy attempt should probably be discussed in a heart rhythm AF team that includes ablation specialists, antiarrhythmic drug specialists, general cardiologists, and in some instances AF surgeons.